Thank you so much, both choirs and orchestra. As we come today, many of you have heard the announcement that we're going to be doing a covenant service today. And it's really a culmination of what we've been talking about since January of 2016. When we announced to the church that this year God has really laid upon my heart in the direction of the body of Christ, especially through the preaching of his word, with the year of the covenant. And we opened up in Genesis with Adam, and then we made our way to Noah, then to Abraham, and the Moses, and the Ten Commandments, and then ultimately the uh, announcement of the new covenant. Um, what we see in this year, there's a common thread um, that kind of zeroes in on all of these covenants, and it's this very clear truth that God deeply desires an intimate love relationship with you. There's nothing more vital, there's nothing more critical in our walk with the Lord. I think sometimes, especially in the 21st century, we kind of capture Christianity with these phrases of, I'm, I'm doing this, or I'm serving in this capacity, or I'm giving this much money, or, or, or these are the things that, and it's rotating around performance or task. Sometimes it's actually a fulfillment of requirements, like I'm being a good husband or I'm being a good wife. And yet, God is really asking us a little bit more than that. The primary target of every covenant that God has is a love relationship with you. And so we're going to just do a brief overview of all the covenants that we've covered in the Old Testament to remind you that not only does God desire a love relationship with you, but in each of these covenants, he will actually reveal himself to you. This is a fascinating thing about God, because a lot of times when we're in covenant, we're thinking of performance or task, or these are the things that I'm obligated to do. But really, in God's covenant, it's more about who he is, and he's wanting you to know who he is. And so he's calling us to covenant, but he's calling us to covenant in such a way that you'll know who you're in covenant with. With. And so, as we call you, but before we go, let me just ask a simple question to you personally. What is your love relationship with Christ like right now? If you had to describe it, if you had to, to give a picture or a portrait of that, what would you, how would you describe a love relationship with Jesus Christ? From previous services, I've had many of them said, Pastor, I want that love relationship, but I feel distant right now. Or I feel like it's inconsistent. Or I feel like it's one-sided. But, but I'm going to challenge you as we go through these next few verses that you ask yourself, what is your love relationship with a covenant-making God with right now? So we open up in Genesis where God's going to reveal himself through his covenants. And, and we're going to look at the covenant with Noah first. And many of you remember the story. But in Genesis 6, verse 18, is the very first time the word covenant is mentioned in the Old Testament. But we're going to fast forward to Genesis 9. But before we do, I want you to remember what's going on at that particular time in that scenario where the creation is now, humanity has now gone away from the Lord. And in Genesis 6, 5, it says that every thought was on evil continually. Every intent of their heart was to walk away from God. And so we know that because of sin, we are separated from God. The prophet Isaiah says this, that he hides his face from us and that w there's a distance between sinful humanity and a holy God. And so God moves, God acts, and he acts in such a way, but before he does, there's a little word that is, is, is expressed in Genesis 6, as far as God's reaction and response to humanity's sin and depravity. It is this word, he was grieved. I think sometimes we don't catch that word because that's a relational word. I think for our students here, when you come with, with marks, sometimes you say pass or fail or high marks or low marks, and, and then that's just a task, it's a performance, but it really doesn't give a relational um, um, description. It's just, I made this grade, or I made this mark, or I get into this school. We do it in our careers as well. We, we've been promoted, or we've been demoted. We've been fired, or we've been hired. And, and we go through all of this, but yet, these are not relational terms. God is, is calling us to covenant. And in that call to covenant, he's calling us into a relationship with him. And when his people went away from him, the word of God says this, he was grieved. How many of you have ever been grieved because your child or your spouse or your family member has gone away from God? 
This is the word. If you can multiply it by a billion, you can begin to understand the depth of God's grief when he says his children have gone away from him. So it's a relational situation. So God sends a flood. He purges the earth of all of its sin, and he starts fresh with a man by the name of Noah. So we pick up in Genesis 9 where he announces the content of this covenant. Let's pick up in verse chapter 9, verse 11. He says, I will establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there be again a flood to destroy the earth. So content of the covenant is very simple. I will never again destroy the earth by flood. Well, what does that reveal to us about God? It reveals his provision. That means that he will provide protection for us. That he will never again destroy the earth by flood. Now, I think um, when we were in um, in East Asia two weeks ago, there was a typhoon that just gone through the Philippines and was making its way toward um, Hong Kong, which Hong Kong shut down. And so we're always in danger of, of typhoons or hurricanes in this time and age. But God's word says he will never again destroy the earth by flood. So that's protection and provision for us. What's the sign of this covenant? So we pick up a sign. Let's pick up in verse 12 of the same chapter 9. God says this. He says, This is a sign of the covenant which I'm making between me and you and every living creature that is with you and for all successive generations, which include us here in Singapore today. Verse 13. I will set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So not only does he make a covenant, he gives us a visual sign. He gives us an outward display, a manifestation, an evidence that he will never again destroy the earth. So this validates and verifies his covenant with us. Now what's unique about this bow in the sky is that the bow was usually a weapon of war. It was a weapon of violence. And yet God will now take this symbol of violence and war and transform it into a sign of peace, a sign of provision, a sign of protection. So it will be a constant reminder to us that God is faithful in his covenant. So when God asks you to come into covenant with him, he wants you to know who he is. He is a God who provides. He's a God who protects. At the end of the service, instead of breaking up in connection groups, we're going to actually ask you to compose a covenant between you and God. And it's going to be a sheet that says, my covenant. And you'll write this covenant and you'll sign it. And then you'll have a place for a witness for that. And then you'll have a place for a pastor or an elder to sign it and pray over you. But before we get into the composition of the covenant, I want you to know who is this God? Who is this covenant-making God? Number one, he's a God who's revealed himself as a God of provision and protection. So we go to the next covenant. Let's pick up in Genesis chapter 12. And now this covenant targets a man by the name of Abram. And many of you recognize this story. And he's going to call Abram to become a great nation. So let's pick up the announcement of this covenant in chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the ones who curses you, I will curse. And I will also, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So just as God revealed his protection and his provision through Noah, he reveals his blessing through his covenant with Abraham. And that blessing will come in the form of one man becoming a great nation who will be given a land. And they'll become not only just a people group, but a political entity that has both status and stability, government and land. And through that government and through that people group and through that nation, God will pour not only his blessings to that people, but that that people will actually become a conduit and a channel to the blessings to the nations, including us in Singapore, including us uh, across that are represented by all the people groups here in IBC. And so this is the covenant with Abram. So what's the sign of the covenant? Let's turn to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 11. And so there is also an outward sign of this covenant. Every sign will will have content, and every, every covenant will have a, a content, and every covenant will have a sign. So what's the sign for the Abrahamic covenant? Look in verse 11 of chapter 17. It says, And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. 
So this is the outward sign of the Abrahamic covenant. That now there will be an outward visible evidence that there was an inward covenant made with Yahweh. And again, this covenant reveals the blessings of God. Now we come to the third covenant. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 4. And this is a covenant that targets Moses. Just as the other two covenant reveals about God, his protection, his provision, and secondly, his blessing, a covenant with Moses, again, will reveal who he is. So let's pick up in chapter 19 in verse 4. The word of God says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And verse 6, and this is the key phrase, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so the, sign of, the content of this covenant reveals to us a part about God, and it is his holiness. And he says, you will be a holy nation, and you will be a royal priesthood. So he's setting his people aside to be holy, to be set apart. Why? Leviticus will tell us, be holy because I am holy. So he's telling us in this covenant as we engage, as we enter to a covenant, that we're making a covenant with a holy God. Well, what's the sign of this covenant? It's not explicitly stated, but it's very visibly throughout the rest of the Old Testament. It will be the Ten Commandments. That there will be two stones, two tablets that contain that they will carry around in the Ark of the Covenant. And these Ten Commandments actually really represent all the law. But those ten says, I want my people to be holy. If you're going to follow a holy God, your action, your lifestyle should reflect the God you follow. And so the sign of that covenant is the Ten Commandments. Now we come to the final covenant in the Old Testament that, we, that was announced. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. And this is an announcement of what we call the New Covenant. And again, each covenant reveals an aspect about God. And again, we're going to call you to compose a covenant. But I want each person here at IBC to know what God, who is this God that we are making? What kind of covenant-making God is he? He's a God who provides. He's a God who blesses. He's a God who's holy. But let's see what this next covenant reveals about God. So chapter 31, beginning in verse 31. This is what he says to the prophet Jeremiah. He says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with the fathers in that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke. Again, there's that disobedience to that covenant. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And on their heart, I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, to, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So this covenant reveals another part of God. You ready for this? It's not like the other covenant that reveals his holiness that required obedience. And that obedience, obviously they weren't faithful in that. And they disobeyed and broke the covenant. So God had to instill a new covenant. Not written on the tablets. Not written on those two tablets of the Ten Commandments. But now inscribed by the hand of God in our hearts. So it's no longer an outward covenant. It's an inward covenant. No longer is it a ritualistic or, or legalistic or performance covenant. It's a relational covenant of a love relationship with a God. So what does that reveal to us about God? The very last phrase, it says, For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This covenant reveals that our God is a God of forgiveness. It assumes, and obviously accurately, that we will sin. And so God is asking you to come in the covenant, not based on your holiness, not based on your obedience, not based on your performance, but based on your brokenness. Break it based on our, our, our depravity, based on our need for a Savior. And so he invites us into this covenant. So what's the sign of this covenant? Well, it's not explicitly stated in Jeremiah, but it's definitely fulfilled in the New Testament when Jesus takes the cup and he passes it around. And he says, this is the blood of the covenant 
for the forgiveness of your sins. So when he died on that cross, that was a visible sign of God's giving you forgiveness. In fact, the first words out of his mouth on the cross was this, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Sign, visible evidence of the covenant that he's offering to you. But I think sometimes we forget that this God who, who forgives, who loves us so much, we've been in church, many of you, a long, long time, and I think we forget the profound impact that when I say these words, does it move you anymore? Just prepare your heart. I'm about to give you some words, and I'm just going to ask you honestly to respond. Does this move you anymore? God loves you. We say it so often. It's almost rhetoric. It's almost uh, it's, it's mechanical. So what I'm going to ask you to do, and I'm going to need some of our musicians to help me on this, okay? I just want us to sing a song that many of us grew up with, the very first song, perhaps, that we learned in vacation Bible school or in Sunday school. Anybody can imagine what that song is? Jesus loves me. So would some of you, you do not want to hear me sing this. You want me to sing with you, but not leading you. So I'm going to ask us just to sing that first verse of Jesus loves me. Can we do that? All right, so start me off, choir members. Help me out. When's the last time that song has moved your heart? That Jesus loves you so much. Last week, um, yesterday afternoon, I had the burden and responsibility of performing a funeral of a family connected to our church of an 11 month old baby. To see the little coffin there, and to see the parents there, and to see that only what God can do, that the love of God found that family, that even through the sicknesses of that child, one of the parents actually accepted Christ through this 11-month trial. Amazing gift of God's love. I think we forget the profound impact of this, it's that we're entering into a covenant of a covenant of a God of forgiveness, of a God of love. And I think we get so stale we get so stoic sometimes. We lose our passion. We lose our fire. We lose that heart that is moved. But sometimes we need to be reminded how relentless the Father's love is for you. At what measure and what length and what distance will he go to reach your heart and, and, and sometimes to chip away through the coldness and the, and, and, and the distance and the remoteness of, of, of just where you are. Six years ago, as a sister when Christ, who's a member of our church, said, Pastor, I've been visiting a certain nursing home, and this person has come up on my radar, and I need you to pray for him. He's an older man. He's in his 80s. He's a Brit. His name is Peter Seidel. And would you pray for him? We've been sharing the gospel. And, and she tells me the story that his family is estranged from him and had been for years and years. He had lived in Singapore, ready for this, since he was in his 20s. He's been in Singapore 60 plus years without any connection to his family in the UK. This really has become his home, but now he's in a nursing home and nobody visits him. Nobody knows him. He's there all by himself. And so they begin to share the gospel, but he's very intellectual. He's very brilliant. And he kind of puts his guard up against Christianity and basically said, my brain cannot understand it. My brain cannot accept it. And so for the next two years, Teresa Ackerman gives and shares the gospel, shares love, shares the, 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 the grace of God, but he rejects it steadily. Well, Teresa moves back, and so moves back home, and so she hands, she, she's faithful, so she hands it to the next lady, and many of you know Joanna Hamburg, who used to be our church clerk, and now she begins to pour that southern hospitality from the deep south in the U.S. and just pours him with food and blessings and love, and yet shares the gospel. His heart is still hard. He still resists. 
Then she moves back, and then she hands them to one, some of you know Stacy Rainwater, who's Cajun from the south, deep south Louisiana, and she's just pouring the love of God. It brings them food, brings them gifts, shares the gospel, and yet the heart is still hard. Resist. This is now in a six-year journey. Stacy just moved back a few months ago, and she handed the task over to Margaret Moody. And so now Margaret is, is witnessing and sharing the love of Christ, and, and still that wall's up there, but he had contracted a lung infection, and her heart grew heavy, and she sensed something that needed to be done, so she contacted Pastor Andy Lim, who's our Chinese pastor, but also now our new member care pastor. She said, would you please come and visit him? I don't know how much longer he has. He's 89 years old. He's legally blind, and his heart is hard. And so Pastor Andy and Sister Susan go and they visit on their 28th anniversary, on their day of their 28th anniversary, they're visiting a nursing home. And they begin to share the love of Christ. Now, Peter is arguing constantly, but Susan is talking about the love of Christ. And it seems to melt his heart. It seems to silence him. But then he made this statement. He says, my brain just can't accept it. My brain refuses to allow Christ to, it just doesn't work. And Pastor Andy, given by the Spirit of God wisdom, said this, Peter, God is not asking you to accept him with your brain, but with your heart. It seems as though the walls, the doubt, the, the arguments just dissolved. And then he, he nodded and, and Sister Susan said, would you like to accept Christ? And Pastor Andy led him in the sinner's prayer. And as he prayed, at the very end of his prayer, he starts singing Amazing Grace. And they were in a ward with five other patients and, 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 and residents there. And, and, and so the three of them were singing Amazing Grace with Peter. And as, as, as Margaret tells the story, the peace of God came across his face. Two weeks later, he passed. He's now in the presence of God. I'm just telling you, God will do whatever it takes to reach your heart. He will hold nothing back. He will unleash everything he has. As the song said, maybe the blessings come in form of suffering and loss, but yet it leads you to Christ, and it's still a blessing. Maybe it's through the, the, the home situation, and, and yet God says his forgiveness is there. This is a covenant of God that we're making. He's a God who provides. He's a God who blesses. He's a God who's holy, but he's also a God who forgives. And so we come to the second part of this section. I'm going to challenge you. God calls us into covenant that he's asking us to respond. Every covenant in Scripture, whether it's Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Israel, us, always says this, God and, and you have to fill in the blank. God doesn't make just a covenant with nobody. He makes a covenant with a person, with a nation. And so now he's calling us into covenant. And he's requiring a response he can offer a covenant of forgiveness to you. He can offer a covenant of protection and provision. But until you embrace it, until you buy into it, until you enter into this covenant, it cannot be sealed. And so what I'm going to walk you through for the next few moments is just possible elements that you can write in this sheet that says, my covenant. And I think it has to start, first of all, with your covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 says it very clearly. With my mouth, I will confess you as my Lord. And with the heart, I will believe. And so it begins there. All the rest of the aspects of the covenant really doesn't have any leverage unless you make that covenant with the Lord. Some of you are right there on the edge of saying, just like Peter, that says, you know, I, I, I'm resisting, I'm resisting. And, and by God's grace, he allowed Peter to live 89 years. Two weeks before his death, he opens his heart up to Christ. God's love is relentless, but it starts there. God says he's ready for you to confess your faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's the first aspect of the covenant. Another aspect is your walk with the Lord, your discipleship, your call to follow him, your call to, to be in his word, your call to prayer, your call to, to, to be a disciple, to be a student, to be a learner. Some people have written on their covenant, I want to memorize scripture. I want to read the Bible daily. I want to pray daily. I want to have my quiet time daily. I'm making a covenant to do this. It may be in the area of a personal struggle that you're having, it, that God is revealing some areas in your life that needs to be addressed. And so with me, and I'll be open and honest here, one of the areas that God has really struck me with conviction 
over the last several months is the inability to, to practice a Sabbath for the soul. That it seems like seven days a week, 24 hours a day, there's something ministry going through my mind and my heart. And so I had to come back the last several months and say, you know what? I'm making a covenant to not take commitments as much as I can on Saturday to get ready for the Saturday service and the three services on Sunday. That Friday's my shutdown day. And I've, I know I've already offended many by, by not taking appointments or by not being able to see, but I'm realizing that I do not have anything to offer if I do not spend my time alone with the Lord, to go away to a lonely place and to rest and to allow God's word to fill in. My primary responsibility here as your under-shepherd is to feed the flock, is to care for the flock through the word of God. And so God has called me and convicted me of that. And so on my covenant, I had to say, I will make a covenant to take the Sabbath of the soul, to take time away. And so God's been working with me in this area. He's been challenging me in other areas too, but this is one of the ones that really I had to let go of many things. I had to say no to certain aspects and just say, you know what? I need to focus in on what God has called me to do it here at IBC, and I can't do that without time designated and allotted to do that. And so I make a covenant with God to do that, and now I have to be accountable to you for that as well. It may be an area, though, in the area of family. The family, and let me talk to you husbands first. Husbands, it may be just simply, I make a covenant to love my wife as Christ loved the church. I make a covenant that I would encourage her, that I would grant her honor, that I would treat her, and that I would, would be edifying, that I would find ways to, 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 to be sensitive and to be caring for her, that, that she would be a priority in my relationships with everything else. Wives, let me talk to you just for a moment. You may just say, I make a covenant to be submissive to my husband as unto the Lord. I make a covenant to, to be respectful to my husband. I, I make a covenant to have a gentle and a quiet spirit. I, I, I make a covenant that as a, as a dad, that I will be the spiritual leader in the home. Some of you men are just waiting for your wives to step up. And yet God has called you to be the spiritual leader in the home. And you may need to make a covenant that says, I make a covenant to be a spiritual leader in my home. And that means I need to take the initiative that I'm not always delegating to my wife. I'm not always just relying for her or my children for the spiritual growth in our family. As a dad, as a father, God has called you to be the spiritual leader of the home. Moms, God has called you to be godly in your influence, to, to be the portrait of compassion and mercy, to be a portrait of, of forgiveness and patience, to, to, to raise your children up in the ways of God. For young people here and for children, you may need to simply make this com uh, covenant. I make a covenant with God to obey my parents. That I make a covenant with God to honor my father and my mother. That I'll make a covenant to, to pray for my mother, to pray for my dad, to pray for my siblings. God is calling us as families. For many of you who are single, there needs to be a covenant in your heart that says, I will be pure until the time that I'm married. That while I'm single, I have an, a, a flexibility and freedom to maybe serve God in a capacity that I could not serve God if I'm married or if I have obligations. And so God is calling you to this as a family member, as a single, as a mom, as a dad, as a young person, as a child, as a husband, as a wife. But it may also extend into the area of ministry, a church. Let me tell you, in the New Testament, there's no such thing as being a believer and not a member of a local church. No such thing. It's 21st century Christianity. It's called shoppers. That you go from church to church and you shop for the best place. And yet God says in scripture that you're called to be a part of the body of Christ. Some of you have been visiting for months and some of, I had a lady last night said, Pastor, I've been visiting for 10 years. How can you visit some, that's like, well, uh, okay, let me back that up. <laughs> I was about to say, that's like dating for 10 years, but some of you have been dating for 10 years, so I don't want to offend you. But at some time, there needs to be commitment. Sometimes there needs to be a covenant made. And so she said, and she prayed right here on the altar, laid it down, and she said, Pastor, I make a covenant to be a member of IBC. I had another man right here in the previous service lay down his covenant and says, Pastor, I'm making a covenant not only to be a member of IBC, but to be baptized as well. Some of you have been on the peripheral for a long time, but we have a covenant-making God. And to me, it's impossible to follow a covenant-making God without being in covenant. Some of you follow from a distance as an observer, as a spectator. But that covenant 
says, I'm going to be committed. What's so valuable about being a member of the church? It's called accountability. How many of you love that word? That was a question. How many of you love that word? How many of you love using that word with your spouse and with your children? You need to, I, I have so many people say, Pastor, I love to be accountable. I said, okay, how's your relationship with your wife? And I don't see them for the next year. Men are struggling with pornography or impurity, and I said, hey, how's you, have you been on the internet? How's your, how's your thoughts? And you know what? I don't hear from them for six months. But pastor, I love accountability. It's amazing how many people say that until you ask. Nobody wants to be accountable. Everybody wants to just do whatever they want to do. And yet being a member says, we are going to hold you accountable, not in judgment, but in love. And some of you are free-floating right now. You're just flying high. You're just flying wherever you want to go. And I'm telling you, God has called you, whether you're here for a month, a year, two years, does not matter. God, and I'm not even saying IBC. I'm just saying God needs you to be in a covenant relationship with a covenant-making God, with a covenant community. Ministry. Some of you need to be connected to ministry and service. Last year, this year is the year of the covenant. Last year, anybody remember? Or do you have spiritual amnesia? What was last year? The year of? Sacrificial What? So not only to serve, but serve when it hurts. Some of you have been absorbing everybody else's service, and yet God has called you to be involved. God has called you to serve. God has called you to connect. Sacrificial service. It may be in the area of work. We talked about two weeks about you yielding to your employer, your boss, the leader of your organization, sometimes even when they're not godly. But as you honor them, you honor God. And so you might need to make a covenant. I've had several covenants said, Pastor, my mouth and the language I use at work is horrible. Now, I know that's only the unholy 915 service. I know that doesn't apply to any holy people here at 1115. But they said, I need to be an example. I need to be a representative. I need to be salt at work as well. I need to model what it means to be submissive. It may be also in the school area as well. I'm making a covenant to, to, to be faithful. Student. To, to, to make sure that I study well, that I would honor God, not just in my grades, but in my attitude and the way that I can encourage the students around me. It may be in your community as well. It may be in the area in which you live. I know Sasha and I made a strong commitment and covenant to connect with our neighbors. And one of them actually came to our church during a funeral when their child was in the same school where we did a funeral of another child that was connected to our church. And they were actually in our church and we were able to connect Sasha was able to lead a, a, across the street neighbor to the Lord. It's just that, that connection, that intentionality of being connected with community, whether it's at work or school, in your neighborhood, in your relational circle, whatever that might be. So now we come to a time of writing your covenant. God is asking you to compose. Now, I'm going to give you some, I know IBC, I've learned through the six years, we need to give us some details. So on that covenant, there's a sheet of paper. And I'm going to ask, is it passed out? Do you guys have it yet? Okay, if, if, if the ush, okay, there, everyone has one? All right. On that covenant, it says, my covenant. And if you don't have one, raise your hand real quickly, and our ushers will get you one. As you, we have some here. Thank you, guys. Okay. If we can have some on this side, too. Thank you, Ming Ping. Thank you very much. Just grab a couple of those, and let's pass those around. Just keep your hands up and our ushers will eventually find you. All right? I know we have several up in the mezzanine too. Thank you, Pastor Jerry. All right, there's a couple key components that I want you to see. One is that there's my covenant and so you compose it. But on the bottom, it says your signature. Okay? And then there's a place for a witness. The reason the witness is there is for accountability. I can't tell you how many times people say, Pastor, I prayed this prayer or, 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 or I made this covenant, but, but they never say what the covenant is to anybody. And so by having somebody read your covenant and write it, so one wife, one lady said this last night, said, Pastor, she showed me the covenant. She said, does my husband have to read this? I was going, well, half of it belongs to your relationship with him. Maybe he ought to read this. But my wife told me this morning, because I've been drafting and redrafting and redrafting. And she says, I'm signing your covenant. <laughs> so however you want to do that, um, whether it's with a family member or a friend, you need to have a witness. All right? And then the last part says a pastor or an elder. And so this is where a pastor or an elder signs that, but also prays over you. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to make ourselves available. We have so many um, pastors and elders that are available. Brother Mike is here. We also have Jody's going to be here for our young people. Pastor Lloyd is going to be here as well. Um, we have Pastor Jerry um, up there as well. And so we have, um, I think Raphael is here, Elder Raphael. And so we're going to have them stationed around um, just where you can find them. But we're going to take the next few moments to compose. Now, when I close this or I transition us in prayer, you are actually free to leave. Some of you say, hallelujah, this is the shortest sermon I've ever seen. Oh, there's Vianney. Vianney, if you, I tell you what, if, if our three elders would stand real quickly where they could see. Okay, and Pastor Lloyd, if you would stand. Pastor Jerry's upstairs. Oh, and Pastor Allen's, okay, and Jody. So these are the pastors that we have. Any other pastors here that I'm missing? All right, Pastor Andy was in the first service, so. Okay, all right, thank you guys. Now, some of you, you, you're free to leave. In fact, some of you are already writing down, I'm making a covenant to be the first one at the MRT. <laughs> okay? That's probably not what we're looking for on that page. All right? Now, some of you say, Pastor, I'm not a member here. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, that may be true. But several of the people have come up to me who are not a member and said, I'm making a covenant to become a member. So that's definitely encouraged as well if that's where God is leading you. But I need you to take the next few moments. Now, some of you need to know what the deadline is. How many of you work better under deadlines? Like if I just tell you, hey, would you please compose a covenant and would you say 95% of them would finish it here? No, maybe not, right? Um, let me give you the deadline. December 25th is the deadline, okay? You say, why is December 25th? Obviously, it's Christmas, right? But it's also the last Sunday of the year. And it will be a Sunday that I will be here. So on December 25th, after the second service, the doors are shut. <laughs> this is the year of the covenant, not the decade, all right? We have to have some motivation to get you moving. And so one lady says, Pastor, I walked out, said I was going to compose it at home, but I caught myself because I know that if I left this door, I would not do that. I came back in and I wrote it. Very honest, wasn't it? So I'm going to encourage you for the next several minutes just to compose. And you can catch us anytime. We're going to be stationed all around. And if you would like to lay it on the altar and pray over it, we, we will be here to do that as well. But we're going to encourage you just to, to compose it. One, one young person said, it was very powerful, put one little phrase. says, I make a covenant to do whatever God tells me to do. Pretty profound. So whatever God prompts your heart, but this is the year of the covenant. It's been culminating for a long time. So I'm going to lead us in a time of transitional prayer. And as you compose, we would be honored to come alongside and pray. But before you find an elder or pastor, I need you to find a witness. All right? That means somebody actually has to read what you've written. They don't have to make a comment on it. They just need to read it where you'll be accountable to them. And, and then finally, we will hand the covenant back to you. For you to, I don't know if you want to post it on Facebook. <laughs> Depends how accountable you want to be. But I would definitely post it in a visible area where you will be reminded of the covenant that you're making with God. Again, it may be in one of these areas or it may be in multiple areas. But the key is we have a covenant-making God and if we claim to follow him, we need to be in covenant with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come to these holy minutes over the next few minutes, Father, that you would move, that you would stir our hearts. Father, that we'll be able to compose from our holy of holies what our, what our God has been doing in our life. Father, from the message last week to our husbands and wives, even those young people who are preparing for marriage, as they prepare, and what kind of wife and what kind of husband are they to be? Father, for husbands and for fathers and for mothers, for, for our young people, Father, to encourage them. Father, as we connect with friends too, Father, the covenant may involve relationships that have been broken or severed, that need reconciliation, that need healing. Father, I pray that you would call that to mind as well whether it's the ministry, whether it's a connection or covenant with a local church, whether it's with our community, whether it's at work, whether it's with extended family. Father, we just pray that you would stir our hearts now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
You can leave any time. We'll be available. So just use this time as your altar, your Holy of Holies, as you compose what God has put on your heart. And we're going to be here at the front or around. 